what are some of the kinds of things that people are coming to you for? Is it a cross-section of situations? Are, are people dealing with depression, anxiety, uh, fear of change, uh, loss, all of the above? Yes, yes, and yes, 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 yes. Um, where I orient, no matter what it is, what, what is the initial contact, yeah, I always orient with communication because if you're unable to speak about something, you know, you're still trying to communicate something. So communication for me is very key. Um, it, 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 it's either complete communication, it's either incomplete communication, or they're not verbal about it, or they don't have the words about it. So when, um, when they are able to, no matter what it is, I had one young woman that came to me and she, she, uh, was, she was diagnosed with um, avoidant personality disorder mm. of some sort. Okay, so she was avoidant. Avoiding, yeah. Yeah, she wouldn't. She would make eye contact. She wouldn't. She was. I mean, we could go in and really pathologize it. And uh, she would come in and she wouldn't look at me. And um, she she would sit there. And we had about four or five sessions. And it was I could not get her to engage and look up at me. So what I did was she would look down on the floor and I got down on the floor. And then she would go lower and so the, to the point where I was kind of like looking up at her and it, 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 it broke it. it. She burst into laughter and that she- That you were willing to go to yeah, yeah. those and she, quote unquote depths yeah, to get to the core of the matter. <laughs> exactly, and she burst into laughter and she said, you did it. You did it, and that was that nobody was nobody else had tried that before. No, anybody no. else, family, friends, other people, maybe she saw the you know for assistance, and no. nobody else came up with uh, that idea. And then years later, you know, we continued to, to we continued to do the work. She had some real heavy duty um, trauma that had come into her life. She was um, sexually assaulted, mm -hmm. and several things that would make a uh, would be logical why she wouldn't want to look at somebody's sure. eyes. Close correct? Down. Yes. Pull in. Exactly. Exactly. So then she she it was it was like she said I didn't know if you were going to pass the test and I looked at her and I said what test? If you were going to yeah. She said well she said nobody nobody went as you said the extra mile. Nobody went the extra mile. So that's kind of, and it's a cross section of that. It's people, I have a, a young gentleman who is um, thinking about changing career positions right now, and he's coming to me about, you know, what's going on there out there in the world. And, sure, yeah. uh, Artificial intelligence coming in and taking over the jobs mm -hmm. and tracking what's going on, like in his private life, what he's doing because it's being tracked, cookies are, and employers are doing that. Right, so that's yeah. a whole other area that has just opened up. And all different ages too you're dealing with? Uh... I deal with I deal with 18 and older. Yeah. Um, I, I find that there's a real need uh, because by the time you're 30, by the time you're 40, the issues that you really wanted to work on or should have been working on or needed to have attention, you know, you're past due at this point. It's right. Like the, um, right. The, emotional, the emotional baggage is now weighing you down. And so I concentrate on that, that frozen trauma, those frozen issues that I haven't thought about that in years, Dr. Latz. Can you believe that? Or that will talk about something Thing, and then they'll start. They'll start expressing their emotions that they never expressed before. What is this thing called a bio, psycho, social model, and how does that come into play with the, some of the work that you do? How do you define what that is? In my research and getting prepared for the interview, I realized that you know you have involvement in that. What is it? And how does it apply to the work you do? Oh, well, biopsychosocial has been around since 1977. It actually started in Rochester, New York, uh, up there at the, um, at the school in Rochester School of Medicine. And what it is is that everything that we have that we feel physically in our body has an emotional component to it. And everything that we feel emotionally or psychosocially or socially mm -hmm. has a biomedical component butterflies in the stomach before you get ready to do an interview, uh, sort of that, that sort of things, you're, you're having some sort of reaction. And what I try to 
if it's a heavy trauma and we're, we're dealing strictly emotional, the first thing I'll ask the person is, where do you feel it in your body? Do you, you know, where, where in your body are you feeling this discomfort? Um, and they always say, well, no, it's, you know, it's, an, it's emotional. Well, yes, it is, but, and then when we talk a little bit further, they will identify either one or two spots where when they start on this subject, where they begin to feel it the most, and then we can go from there. And that goes back to the biopsychosocial. If you're feeling, um, if you're feeling uh, cold, most times you might be hungry, but a lot of times you just might be just lonesome. Okay, and so you if know, you're feeling physically cold, yeah, if you're feeling physically oh, wow. cold, you, you might be lonesome. And that trust is very important. Establishing the trust between you and the client, and the client and you, because when that trust is established, and, and you're aware of it, and they're aware of it, they can emote and they can share, and then grow through that experience. Right? Trust is very important. Uh, trust is fu a fundamental uh, value, uh, just by being human. You know, our trust begins to grow when, when we're little. In our families, it begins to grow. It begins to grow. And when it's violated at whatever age or whatever level, it is hard. And it depends upon who violated the trust. The societal pressures that are put on us by um, the speed of information, the overwhelming amount of information coming at all age groups, including kids too, who are trying to decipher it and understand it all. And then of course, adding in societal pressures that come from the advent in recent years of social media, mm -hmm. which has a lot of marketing and psychological aspects to mm -hmm. how that is, algorithms and how that is all playing out. These are some newer things that people are really dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis across the board for all demographics, age groups, cultural, uh, backgrounds and more. Have you seen an increase in people struggling with some of that and anxiety, depression, confusion over all of, you know, how they're supposed to deal with that and who am I with all of this going on? Um, yes. I mean, it, it, um, it seems to be, it seems to be snowballing uh, to people that I would not have even thought would be picking up certain issues with it. Um, there is a whole diagnosis now that's going on in the diagnostic manual uh, where your uh, politics, there is a, where people are actually, you know, so, an addiction is such a word that's batted around a lot, but they just can't disconnect from it. Yeah. There's also where they, the fear of uh, being offline. The, there's a, the fear of that. There's the fear of losing your phone, your cell phone. Uh, those are all di the, those are all diagnostic. We can diagnose them, and the biggest um, the biggest diagnostic um, what I want to say uh, issue is stress. That in 2019, that's the highest uh, DSM diagnosis a person can get. And that is the highest one that they're they're giving out now. And that's, it's, these it, things are what just, are adding stress. to it. And the stress, and then they don't even you can't even break them down because there's so many. The news, the the stress, the fear of the fear of not having enough finances. I mean, in the United States, we have seven generations that are living right now in the United States and all have different needs and different wants and different desires. And how are they being met? Social media, okay, who's going on a date with you? Well, it's, it's you. It's all of your social media that you're associated with, all of the person you're going with. So we've got, when did a, a date between two people include thousands? Right. And they're weighing in on it. And, and, and the they're photos weighing, and liking, is, is it a, validation, seeking approval from the world because they're not getting it from other sources, including themselves, so they need validation, love of others, others, the masses, people we will never probably even come across. You just hit on it. I, I think it's, it's my view, but I think it's see me. Nobody's been seeing me. Nobody's been hearing me. Uh, we go back to the uniqueness of their people's story. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll hear you, I'll see you. I want to be seen, I want to be heard. I validate who I am. Do you really see me? 
So I've been working with a lot of different people with Disconnect. Disconnect 15 minutes a day. You know, how many times have you been out to dinner and everybody's on their phone? Nobody's talking Constantly. to each other. Constantly. The art of conversation is going away. So, you, you know, dock your phones. Well, we can't, we're not going to get off the phones. Well, yes, we need to. I think that the social media has caused what is called uh, social envy in comparison. But also, I don't think anybody considers this. Uh, or maybe they have. Uh, maybe this is a Dr. Latzism or Dr. Marthaism. Uh, that p that things that are already that are being posted are already outdated. Oh yeah. They're already outdated. Yeah, right. So it's like it's like it's you're not in instant time. You think you are, but you're not. Or you know you were really so happy about the twelve dozen red roses your boyfriend For sent Valentine's you. Valentine's Day. Yeah, and then you get what's what is he cheap? I got two dozen, and then you get somebody yeah. else to say, well, I got three dozen, and it's like it just devalues the uh, yeah what, dozen that you got. So 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 when does our social media tell us about our relationship? You may be you may have a person that could only afford the one rose. Right. But but has all the other qualities that you want. You know, trust and compassion. It's not always quantity or exactly, quality. Exactly, right? exactly. So it's like so are, when did we do, so are we going to continue and that's a conscious choice. It we really can, is. We can stop the madness. We can stop the madness. It's hard. But we can stop the madness because what you'll get is priceless. I'll share this. I had a I had a woman. I was doing um, I was doing a, a, a talk, a radio show on fear of missing out, um, and it was around the holidays. And um, uh, she asked me to to redo it. You know, to to redo and you know, what is the fear of missing out? You know, she can you know, always in. She, she then sent me an email saying, I'm so glad I re-listened to it. She says, as I was doing it, I realized how many things I missed out. I missed out my son's first words. I missed out when he took his first step. You know, the fear of missing out because I was constantly checking my phone mm -hmm. in my social media. Trying to create a world that isn't even necessarily real. Exactly. When you have a real world and people going right on there. And then that little yeah. girl that was trying to With get the, mother. her, the mother's the mother's attention. So it it's it's um, it becomes a conscious it's like it's like you have to decide a no more. Or that you know I can limit this. I don't necessarily have to have this. And when people are having sleep problems, I'll say, okay, uh, what have you got? What's electronically you got by your phone, by mm -hmm. your by your bed? Yeah. It's their phone. It's their computer. It's their laptop. It's their t tablet. They've got their TV Everything. in the room. And I said, you, you know, you're not ever getting to sleep. Everything goes off outside and not in the bedroom. Bedroom is, is where you, that's your sanctuary. To get away from it all. Exactly. The solace, the and peace. And that's hard for people to lean away from. One of the other things that you do too that I think is really important, it's a beautiful thing you do, is you, you apply people's pets to the work that you do. How are pets comforting to people in their daily lives and how do you incorporate the pet into the work that you do? Well, one of, well, on the intake, when we do an intake, I ask them if they have pets. And they usually say they do or they don't. And then we, what type and whatever. And I'll get an idea of how, when they talk about their pet, you know, what level of connection they'll have with them. Uh, you know, um, and then, then it's, you know, talk, we'll go back to the trust issue. Your pet, your, your dog, your a uh, cat. Um, I mean, I've had other people that have had, had other pets, you know, but we'll just go to the common dog and cat. Um, it's unconditional. You know, trust, it really is. trust is there. That, that animal, that dog, your pet, trusts you completely. Trust you that you're going to come home, you're going to walk them, you're going to feed them, you're going to change their water, you're going to sit there, they're going to put their head in your lap, or how, whatever, whatever the connection. The same thing with a cat will do the same thing. So they are the keeper of our secrets. 
they are they understand our emotions you know how many times you know I've had people say to me you know they always know I've had a bad day how do they know I had a bad day um, or or if they've lost their pet you know it's very difficult mm -hmm. on them so our pets are un uh, they are the ones that rely on us and so it's a, a trust bond so, it really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah Going yeah. back to the trust, yeah. which is so important. I think what people get confused with, it's mindfulness. Right. Are you mindful of right. what you're reflecting on? Right. And I think when you're mindful of what you're reflecting on, more and more comes. More and more comes to you. More and more answers come. That's a very big word. I'd right love to now. delve into that a little bit deeper for the audience. Uh, we're hearing so much about it yeah. and the importance of it. How do you define mindfulness and then how do you work that into your practice and when you're working with your clients to have them recognize the importance of mindfulness? Uh, most people don't talk about mindfulness. Right. So what I'll talk about is what is your goal? And if we're mindful, we're, 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 we're aware of it's sometimes things that are harsh need to be said, but it's also the attitude in which we do it. Mindfulness, I think, also goes hand in hand with um, a full apology, mm. a sincere apology. Right. right. Uh, so a sincere apology and accepting a, a sincere apology is a three-pronged process. Jim, I am sorry. Okay, and it's say, like, okay, yeah, don't worry about it, right? Don't worry sure, about yeah. it, that's okay. It's okay, sorry. Yeah. No, uh, but you're thinking, what is she sorry about? I'm thinking, I'm sorry about I stepped on your toe, and I really didn't say I was sorry, and I know I had hurt your toe. And you're thinking, oh, she's sorry about that um, she slammed the door. And that's kind of like a real simplistic thing, but it's incomplete. So you're thinking, oh, she's apologizing for slamming the door. Right. And I'm th thinking, no, I'm apologizing for stepping on for your the foot. the other thing. Okay, so, we, so the issue is open, okay? And you say, uh, you accept it. Well, what are you accepting? Stepping on your foot or stepping on, you know, slamming the door. So a complete apology or a more sincere apology is, Jim, I am sorry for stepping on your, your foot the, you know, the other night. I know that really hurt. Um, you know, what can I do to make that up for you? I know I scuffed your shoes, whatever I can do. What can I do to make it up for you? That's a complete, sincere apology. Right. Then you're, you would say to me, okay, okay, you know, you stepped on my toes and you really did scuff, you really did scuff the shoe, you know. Um, yeah, can you take them to the, the shoemaker for me so that I can get them professionally polished? Sure, not a problem. So, so that issue will not come back. Because it always comes back to us, right? We, we can get all this information, all this advice, and all the, the helpful nature of it all, but it, when it comes down to brass tacks, to reality, we have to take responsibility for our own actions, thoughts, words, and that's life. Hard. And that's hard for people. I mean, it's hard, okay? Um, but I think that's something that we need to, that we need to refresh ourselves over and over again. We are taught little, uh, uh, you know, t to do that. But as we grow older, we, we kind of forget that. But is it something that we need to refresh? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we do. Um, I think sometimes, and having someone, and I think that's where therapy or a therapist is really important. Mm -hmm. Uh, because having someone that is not in your family, that you're not going to sit down at um, Thanksgiving dinner and look and across the, uh, uh, you know, but that you can, that uh, is are... Un unbiased. So to have somebody like you, bringing it all back to you, have somebody who has all of his wisdom and perspective and experience and education, but can be unbiased, clean slate, unbiased when you're working with your clients. Your practice is carefully tailored to making the therapy individualized so you really like to make every effort to emphasize the entire person right yes. and that's important to you yes it tell is. us about how you do that well you know it's it's called joining them at their world in their world view I may not hold the same world view as they do but their world view is very important 
and it also goes into honoring their life and their story of their life. Okay, so no, maybe I'm not one that's going to go out and sit out there and count grizzly bears. That's not me. Not but thing, uh, yeah. but if it's them and they and they're excited it about that, brings them joy. That, yes, please. Or I'll read up on that. Oh, that's mm -hmm. you know you you like that. Okay, and I'll I'll do some kind of little research on what what they like to do if you know if, if I have that information mm -hmm. and so we can talk about it um, because it's not just about it's not just about the problem or the issue as I like to say uh, a, a problem or an issue is a solution waiting to happen and so it's like okay how are we going to do it and it you know uh, so it's, I'm going to uniquely join them in their worldview if they're um, if they're excitable family, you know, we'll talk about it. Okay, so who's all, who's the emotional part of it? Who who is who is the emotional like oh, this one family? I had um, three people in the family. It was mother and, and father and two sons. Uh, three of them were all extroverts. I mean, they were blah 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 blah. blah, blah. You know, they were coming in. I mean, you couldn't get an ad. ad and they and the the younger son, the other son, was sitting there, and I'm looking at the younger son, and he's not. And they're just over talking, over talking me, over talking each other. Just they just you know, it's like it was like trying to corral puppies, you know, in, yeah. in the room. And you so a bullhorn. Yeah, exactly. So I asked them. I asked them, would you know, would you? Uh, I'd like to have some time with, um, well, I'm going to call him Sam, I'd like to have some time with Sam, uh, so you know, would you go out in the ra waiting room? And they said that they would. They closed the door, I looked at Sam and I went, oh. he goes, yeah, right? And so we <laughs> talked about it and so what it was is that Sam didn't want, it wasn't that Sam didn't want to participate in the family, there was no room for him to participate in the family because they were all extroverts and he was an introvert. Not a painfully shy introvert. He was just an introvert, and so and so I asked Sam, "What do you, what are we going to do about that? What do you want to do about that? You have thoughts about what they're saying?" Yes, I said, "Okay." I said, "If I get if I get you the room, will you talk about it?" And he said he would. So they all came back in, and we, they started they started the whole thing. And I said, "Wait, wait, 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 wait. Time out. You've all had your say. Uh, Sam would like to talk." And the room got quiet, mm -hmm. and so it's it was like, um, and they were just they were they were trying to solve a problem, and he had the solution. And I said, so when you think about it, when Sam gets the floor, he usually has the solution to something, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, yeah. So it changed the dynamic a little bit. I did couldn't change them from being extroverts. Sure. They were all going to be extroverts. Were they all going to overtalk Sam? Yes. But maybe now they'll pause quicker, uh, sooner rather than later when they t when he when they talk to him. So. That's a beautiful story. <laughs> they all are beautiful stories of success.